welcome to the first of the Omega United Roundtable Reviews. Um, hopefully this will be the first and there will be more to come after this, but it could be very interesting. So today we have uh, Star Trek Horizons, which has just come out um, from Mr. Tommy Craft. Um, we've just finished watching the film and now we're going to talk about it. So first I will introduce myself. I am uh, Mackenzie, Murdoch Mackenzie, at uh, Talk Too Much on Twitter. And I will uh, pass it round the table for everybody to introduce themselves. Evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dragon, uh, one of the co-hosts of Tribbles and Ecstasy. Uh, I also have a Twitter handle at, of at D. Hello, everybody. My name is Estes. I am the CEO of Omega United Gaming Community. Uh, we are at uh, weareomega.com, and I'm also uh, going to be uh, helping out with this review as much as I can. My name is Thulak. I am the XO of Omega Armada in STO or Star Trek Online. Hello, everybody. My name's Gunberg. Uh, avid Star Trek fan since as long as I can remember, and one of the shortest profiles on this list. Fantastic. So there you go. That's our five for today. I will give you a bit of a backstory first with this. Um, on the Troubles in Ecstasy podcast that Dragon is a part of, uh, they had Tommy Craft, the creator of Star Trek Horizons, on, who uh, came on to talk about the film and uh, showed an interest in this idea of us sitting down and having a, a roundtable discussion of what we thought of the film after watching it together, especially from people who are in, who play Stowe, because that's Star Trek Online, because we... Uh, the story interlinks uh, to a degree within it. So we'll start right at the easy question. Overall, uh, what do people think? Overall, it's a very watchable film. Um, there are some issues I have with the technical aspects of it, but overall, it was enjoyable. Yeah, I, I would have to mirror that. Um, yeah, there there are some uh, lens quality issues that are are there. Um, but I will definitely have to agree that it's considerably better than a number of the other fan productions that I've seen come out recently. I'm not entirely certain how much of a budget they had on this particular film, because clearly budget will dictate the quality of a film. But uh, for what it was, um, and as Dragon mentioned, it is a fan-made fan, fan -made film. Uh, and based on other ones that I have watched, yeah, it's it's very watchable and Minus the, the, the technical uh, blemishes, which I'm pretty sure we'll all agree on, but uh, uh, very watchable. Yeah, indeed. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Estes, he said his budget was only like 40000 it, it was very, very minuscule for, for the length of work that was produced. Um, that's actually pretty, uh, pretty impressive for uh, 40K, considering that I'm sure some of these actors that I've been looking up now, they actually are professional actors, so... You know, I'm assuming that the... Uh, did he say how long the filming was on this? If he did, I don't remember off the top of my head. Cool. No, it's definitely a decent film. I mean, it's a little rough around the edges, but it's a fan project. I tried to get that around my head first and foremost. I'd be very curious to see what they could do with a higher caliber of actors and maybe like a, like a TNG two-parter to kind of flesh out the story. The premise was nice. Yeah, I mean, um, there's there's a number of things which I've kind of come to expect from um, fan films and films in general nowadays that, that become trends. So there are things in there that I naturally pick up on that I see in a lot of stuff nowadays. But actually, regardless of all of those things, I actually found the story interesting. It kept my attention, um, which is actually more than I can say for some professional quote-unquote films. Yeah, for, for something to, to keep uh, especially your attention lately, that's saying something. So let's, now, let's now get in. Dragon. <laughs> oh, I am being nice. I mean, come on. No, it is true. Um, I tend to be very harsh with, with my reviews. I mean, I, I have a number of notes, um, but I'm not, I do take, to a degree, I take a, a, a grain of salt with things like this. Um, and this was, this is higher up on the list of... of the, the Star Trek fan films that I've seen. Um, so, kind of getting into the, the nitty-gritty of things, um, starting at stage one of kind of how to build something like this, the story of of the film, the, and of course, there will be spoilers throughout this, it is a fully-fledged review, so uh, if you haven't seen the film, go and watch it and then come back. 
But the story, yes, obviously... We, we should have announced at the very beginning. Spoiler! Spoiler warning, there you go. That's uh, kind of a prerequisite for doing anything nowadays. Yes, unfortunately. So the story, um, obviously it's based on the Temporal Cold War stuff um, from Enterprise, which I admittedly haven't seen because I haven't watched through all of Enterprise myself. Um, and it follows the crew of the Discovery, the NX-04, uh, as they try to battle the Romulans and we end up tying in the Iconian story from Star Trek Online. Um, so it's time travel and all of that jazzy kind of stuff that is very common nowadays. What did you guys think of the story uh, it kind of in itself, regardless of obviously the way that it's all put together. Um, actually, I liked how how he basically continued the story from what was in Enterprise, uh, referring to some of the different characters from that series, and and the way he he tied everything together. Um, I like how he used the Romulans in there. Um, I think they could have been a little more devious, but yeah, that's just me. Um, and at the same time, um, he mentioned a lot of the icon the iconic Star Trek races and gave them, I feel, the respect that they were due their place within the, the overall story arc and, and genre, considering that, yes, the story does take place prior to the founding of the Federation, and he, and he presents it in such a way that it doesn't... Um, doesn't give away too much of the future happenings that help actually bring the the full founding of the Federation into play. For me personally, uh, I'd actually mirror uh, what uh, Dragon is saying. Um, I do uh, I do see that uh, his his continuation from that story of Enterprise. I think he did a good job, but I think they actually spent some good time into figuring out how they wanted to uh, uh, structure their story. Uh, the only part of the film that I personally did not like, just to be perfectly honest, I did not like the introduction of the Temporal Officer and the Temporal uh, uh, Division uh, as a whole. Uh, I don't think it was in place, and it sort of didn't really serve any real significance in my opinion. Um, I think they could have just done without that altogether, and... Uh, uh, remove that character to be honest uh, i didn't feel that it, uh, she was she actually played a real purpose to anything uh but that's just my opinion i, I mean it's it does kind of come across as a as a bit of a cop out in a sense it's it's like exactly. how can we how can we bring this one bring this character back into it um and to give us a reason for all this going on and a way of sorting it out um which has been done in trek before um, and is is kind of common nowadays within a lot of stories of hey this person turns up who just happens to be the the one that we need to save the day and it had that kind of element to it where it, when she turned up I was like I kind of saw it coming it, when she's saying like you need to save me and he doesn't understand what she's trying to say and it of course. my instinct kind of said oh wait that means she's still alive and she's trying to communicate with him so yeah. I wasn't surprised by it. Um, they maybe could have spent more time coming up with a a more interesting way of solving the problem. Yeah, it almost seemed like they were trying to add in some type of love interest, you know, which almost all movies try to do. They try to add in some type of love interest, and it was sort of their way to stitch it all together. They needed this massive loss at the beginning to get your emotions to pop out, and then, you know, the captain goes into his whole spiel about, you know, his losing his fiance and going through that massive loss, and then to have her again. I mean, I feel like they're just trying to add in an element to get you to go through a bit of an emotional roller coaster. And this is sort of the, what they did to, to, you know, to justify her reintroduction into the plot. You know what I mean? And honestly, it, to me, it really didn't affect me emotionally. It was just like, it was there, you know. I mean, I they should have probably had a better way of doing it, you're right. But, you know, I mean, it is a minor detail, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't emotionally connect with these characters. Like the best See, films that me, I have. It was, with me, it was one of when they tried to humanize the captain, that extra bit just kind of, yeah, was a little too much. It, it was very much a very formulaic in the sense that it's 
oh, and here's the the character growth scene. Like, there, there's not a lot of natural building that you feel goes throughout the story, which is a, a common fault nowadays of telling the audience when character development is happening rather than showing them. Um, the best example I can use is is the scene in. For anyone that hasn't seen Star Wars: The Force Awakens, this is a spoiler for that. The scene where Rey gets told that she knows her parents aren't coming back, and it's it's this thing of saying you don't see her build as a character. You see, you get told that her character is developing, and there were those, those scenes of him saying, "Look, I lost somebody," and blah blah blah, blah and and also the stuff with the engineer not liking Tamara, the uh, the Romulan girl. It's it's very much a, a thing of it's telling you that these characters are, are developing. I mean, we didn't even know there. I mean, there was no way of, for me. There's no way of knowing that until they tell you that. Oh yes, this person like was in love with this person. You know, it's just like so. And I really didn't get that sense of emotional connecting with these characters and these. These actors. Yeah, that was a bit of a rough spot on my part as well. You were supposed to try to connect with these characters and thus feel the loss as they did, but we haven't been really introduced to these people. It, we've been kind of thrown into the situation midstream, and whenever they express a, a loss, we are just kind of assumed to go along with it. And it was a little rough, especially when you find out much later that there were these tiny little threads between them such as the uh the relationship between the captain and the lieutenant you know there 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 is a real reason and you can actually tell the difference between an actor who makes 50,000 a year and who makes millions because you know that that connection that you feel from actors you know comes from their acting and during a lot of those scenes i mean you know i'm not i don't mean to stick it to the actors but you know um you know the 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 skill and level of acting will help with that development because they can relay you know exactly each scene that they're presented with to work at but you know some of the writing too probably needed work and uh, uh you know just just character development as a whole it's a forty thousand dollar film i mean i expect it not to be that great but i mean i think i think they could have done a better job with that i think the the thing that really sticks out and admittedly for me the the weakest point of it was the acting is that acting is is effectively free um obviously you have to pay your actors but the actors within themselves are then responsible for for bringing out a performance uh, with themselves and with the actors who are around them um and it was very much i didn't feel there was a lot of definition with the characters like there's you didn't really get who the characters were as people, uh, there isn't distinct character traits. The little things that we have, like uh, Worf is slightly more aggressive, and you you get that from him. Picard is more stuck up. Riker is the more easygoing one, um, but he's also a very honourable character. You pick these things up uh, as you go along, and you pick them up in in the first episode of TNG, um, and you get the same thing in films. And there's there's that element for me was missing, um, where you can't. You don't you don't really know who these people are as you're going through it. They they do things that could be in character and could be out of character depending on who they supposedly are, but we never find out, so we never get a, a level playing field so we know where to build from. Now, on that note, I think it might be reaching a little too far, but if they were aware of this to use it heavy-handedly, lack of character development because of the time constraints and budget and what have you. I feel like in certain parts, and I think I'm not alone, they were really trying to echo, say, original cast members from different Star Trek series, almost in a vain attempt to get us to relate to them artificially. Do you, do you have anybody or any one person in mind that you can state? Well, I mean... In general, you know, this is an Enterprise era story, mm -hmm. and we're on an NX class ship, and everyone within their position seems to kind of be an almost parody of the Enterprise crew. So we're automatically kind of overlaying those original characters onto this cast so that they can afford to be able to 
you know, just do as they do and progress with the story. And we kind of say, oh, well, this is the captain and this is this is the comms officer. This is the pilot. These are who these people are. And then, you know, they've peppered in their own little backstories here and there. I mean, yeah. I very much got the, the feeling that for me, the one who came across the most as being almost copied over is Ensign Marie, who's the comm officer. But from what I saw of Enterprise, there wasn't much of a character there to begin with in the show with uh, Sato. Um, so if that role, she fills the same role and effectively is the same thing yep. um, without building too much into her. Always felt like one of the, the most kind of least worked on characters within Enterprise from the standpoint of what yep. I saw. I'd agree now, with that since, since we're discussing character development on this part, um, one of the things that bugged me is one of the very, very, very few things in, in the entire show that did um, is the fact that the captain and the chief engineer's backstories were so fucking close to it, perfectly identical. Pardon my language for those that are easily offended, but yeah, that's who I am. Uh, yeah, I, that that just bothered me as to how almost identical their backstories were. Yeah, well, to me, it was like all of these characters were like interchangeable. You could make the engineer, the captain, and not have any any distinctive differences. Like with as the <clears throat> when Trip was the engineer. He'd always fly off the handle. He'd be have short temper, at, or make assumptions and stuff like that. None of these people there. I mean, they're like inter interchangeable pieces. There wasn't anything really to distinguish them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I do. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, there there was that rather noticeable. Uh, such as when the captain and the chief engineer were sitting in engineering and they had their little heart-to-heart, -heart, which was when you found out that, yeah, their backstories were so much alike. Um, and the captain said, well, yeah, I know your crew is not here yet, but I wanted to get a head start on this. And as we were watching the movie, somebody mentioned, well, when did you become a matter-antimatter specialist? <laughs> Actually, we he was working on the transporter, I thought. I mean, it's it's one of those things with the backstories of both of them being very similar. Throwing in a, a relative's death is a very easy way of creating backstory and, and history for a character. Um, yeah. And maybe it was an oversight or maybe it was like an active decision. But it, to me, it gave me the instinct of... That it's it's looking at the individual parts. So they looked at each individual character and went, oh, okay, this character can have this and this character can have this. And what didn't happen is they didn't then look at them as a group and say, okay, where are the similarities here and where are the differences? What makes this a dynamic, interesting crew? Yeah, I, I would have to uh, mirror a lot of that. Um, yeah, the, the, it was just some of the whole interpersonal dynamics were, were missing there from it being a, a, an even more watchable movie than what it currently is. Yeah, it, you know what? At the end of the day, it really just depends on what you're comparing this to. If you're going to compare this to a Hollywood blockbuster, you shouldn't. <laughs> you know, this should strictly be uh, uh, compared, in my opinion, it should be compared to films of uh, equivalent budget and style. Uh, but... Uh, you know, uh, it, definitely they should have spent a little bit more time on figuring out their characters. Uh, and, uh, you know, because that's, that's free. I mean, when you're doing a fan-made project, you know, you're pretty much doing this, you know, this, there's a very small group of individuals who are working on this. Um, did, uh, the, did the director actually say how many people uh, helped make Star Trek Horizons? The story, the writing, all that. Did he actually come out with a full... Uh, cast listing? Um, not that I have seen. Um, I imagine that if myself or, or somebody at, were to actually ask him, he would more than likely be forthcoming with that information, though. Okay. 
he, he's been really, really good at, at saying, hey, uh, there was one point that he actually used some of the money that he got from uh, this one little crowdfunding campaign that he thought he needed a different piece of software than what he had. Okay. So he used some of that crowdfunding money to get the license for it and then ended up issuing an apology saying, yo, guys, um, I screwed up. This this software is not what was needed. It was too confusing. I, I just I could not end up making I could not end up getting this to work for me. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I do apologize. And, and he used software that he was familiar with. And um, in fact, the, the software that he had gotten, I can't even remember the name of it, but it was to do the rendering of that island that they ended up uh, beaming on and seeing the, uh, the that hologram on. And uh, he ended up not using the software because what he already had worked considerably better for rendering that landscape. Yeah, I'm just looking at their website right now. And as far as I can see, I think Tommy Kraft was the only writer on this project. So, um, yeah, I think seeing how that was probably free for him, he should have just spent a little bit more time uh, on uh, character development on paper because I think there was a lack thereof. I mean, that's that's kind of where I draw the line between things is it's a case of is this something that needs money so the the direction and the the um the direction and the story and the acting is all stuff that arguably doesn't cost you anything direction is obviously limited by the resources that you have but right. when you draw out story and acting and character that's stuff that, that people spend i mean the, the nolan brothers spent 12 years writing inception just to get it right just to get it to a point where where it, they were happy with it, and obviously it's you're not dealing with a big budget film like that. Um, that's a major undertaking. But uh, one of the first things I do when I'm trying to write something is to say, okay, let's look at my characters and who are these characters? Who are they? What's it? What is it that makes them different from each other? And why are they that way? Which it felt like it just needed a little bit more of that. There was yeah. characterization there. But it just wasn't it wasn't quite deep enough for the characters to be memorable. Yeah, it wasn't as developed as it needed to be. But everything you've just said is bang on. So kind of tying into the character thing, um, obviously, is the acting side of it. So where did we where do we stand on the acting? Obviously, we're not going to move into realms of slander, and I don't think anybody would anyway. But where do we stand on the uh, on the acting side of things? Well, it was kind of generic acting it was just more of a generic feel than any anything else to me yeah i mean uh, execution of some of the lines and uh you know uh again we understand that uh, these are not high paid actors but uh, i do feel that the uh that uh the execution of lines um you know and uh, their acting skills as a whole um, it was for what it was, you know, there was a lot of scenes that were, that were all right. I mean, they, it definitely, uh, had me convinced to some degree that they were actually in character, but again, it's, uh, uh, the acting can only be as good as, as the writing, uh, initially. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I think if the character development was better, uh, the, uh, the acting would have been more, uh, direct excuse me, would have been more, uh, the delivery would have been more uh, uh, effective. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the big things for me, whenever it comes to somebody doing Star Trek, is you're dealing with alien races, and alien races that have already been predefined. So if you've got somebody in a role of an alien race who isn't playing well within that role, it tends to have a major effect on how things comes, come across. Um, but on the flip side of that, for this one, I actually found that um, Rico E. Anderson is his name, who played the Vulcan uh, ambassador, who is arguably, Vulcans are always one of the hardest people to play. I've seen very few people in fan films actually put it off convincingly as playing a Vulcan. I found that his performance actually stood out as one of the better performances, along with um, Rocco, I'm probably going to butcher his last name, uh, Guirlanda, who played uh, Daikon, who was the bad guy, also had 
that element of him that you could you felt like he was a Romulan. He had that edge to him that Romulans have, rather than the cold disconnect which Rico E. Anderson gave us as a Vulcan. Yeah, he he the the guy that played the Vulcan. I'm sorry, I think he nailed it with the just the the cold deadpan look that he had on his face, the way that he reacted to this potentially yeah galaxy ending weapon being discovered that close to uh, that close to Earth. I mean, yeah, he in my opinion he nailed the Vulcan down perfectly. I mean, the whole fact, also to me, the whole fact that they had that uh, Romulan looking like that guy in Enterprise who is directing the Sulaban, you know, get real. That's a little bit old and dated. And they need to, he needed to, if I were him, I probably would have had, a, had shown him a hologram of the Romulan. And that way, the Rom, we know that this is a Romulan talking to Romulans but you know now one thing I, go ahead, uh, one thing that actually caught me off guard in this was his portrayal of the Iconians see I was a little bit confused by that because obviously the only real Iconians I remember um, are the ones from Stowe who obviously look considerably different um, I was unsure at the beginning whether the two people that we saw were Iconians or not um, which obviously as we went through, I kind of went, okay, yeah, these these guys obviously are Iconians, um, but it, it did it did surprise me. I mean, when Iconians from the movie versus what's in Star Trek Online, there it's night and day. Um, in the game, they are obviously the bad guy. They are obviously the the antagonist, not the protagonist. In in this case, um, you, you have to lean more towards they were put antagonistic uh, seat because in this case they were trying to live up to more or less their version of the Federation ideal of yeah try to minimize the harm that you should do and yeah I mean that I have to give him a lot of credit on by the fact that he did not let outside influences taint his view of what he wanted to see of the um, what he wanted to see happen with his version of the uh, of that race. Wow, I stumbled a lot on that. Now, as far as acting goes, I think it was a very interesting spectrum across the board. Of course, we've already touched on Rigo's uh, magnificent role as a Vulcan. Perfect Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think that this the the film overall, in terms of acting, suffered from two major speed bumps. One was, in certain scenes, I don't know if it was the writing or directing, but the story that we were pre presented thus far, uh, alongside the special effects that were being thrown at us, the actors really didn't seem to be aware of their situations. If, if it was a very tense moment, Nobody seemed to really understand that. They were all just delivering very flat, very calm lines. And I understand from a, a military perspective, I would say, okay, they're being professional. They're, they're doing their jobs. But very early on, we're already kind of privy to this crew not being very professional, even at wartime. They're all cutting loose. They all wear their... Uh, emotions on their on their sleeves they they pal around together they you know it's not a very professional group the other speed bump would probably be techno babble and i know in trek anymore it's it's a do or die situation when you have to talk techno babble and there was a lot of scenes in in this film where everybody had to sit down and deliver the situation basically an exposition dump to the audience in which case there were really some cringe-worthy acting and line delivery, I must say. Well, I mean, I completely agree with you on that. On on your first point, I mean, one of the first things that Captain Hawk says is, 
I think he says go to hell to the, to the Romulans who are chasing him, which kind of sets this precedent of okay, he's not quite the the rule following captain which we are used to seeing with with the older ones. But one of the earliest words that I wrote down when it came to those the line delivery during moments of tension was urgency. They may be trained officers, but even in the military, there is still urgency within a situation. Things are, are heated, things are, are moving quickly, and you have to move at that pace, otherwise you fall behind. Um, so it lacked that feeling of they're in a battle, um, which was which was a shame to see because it drags you out of it in a bit. A, a bit. Now, Max, I, I will have to disagree with you on, on part of what you just said. Um, in, in this case... The way that the captain delivered that go to hell line to the Roman, if you think about it, it was very, very reminiscent of Kirk from the original series. Um, it was said basically matter of factly, and he didn't really care what the outcome was. He still was going to do what he had to do to try to save his ship and crew. Oh, no, yeah, completely. Um, I, it, was, it was a thing of uh, that more defined who he was. Um, and then it was other stuff uh, the rest of the time which kind of didn't have that level of... He was quite clearly in a situation where he had to deal with it, and his way of dealing with it was to say, go to hell. It wasn't the measured kind of, we're not going to go along with what you say, we're not going to surrender. It was just a, go to hell, there's your answer, let's move on. Yeah, um, but it was other times around it that, that people responded. It's like when people say things like the shields are down, or they're... they're three Romulan warbirds uncloaking on off our starboard bow. It's stuff like that where you go, you feel like it should be a, here's the information you need, let's deal with this straight away, and it didn't have that punch to it. Uh, I think they should have actually emphasized that scene a little bit more with him saying go to hell, because it really would have been a character-defining moment. Because, I mean, you're expecting this, if we're going to talk about him being militaristic and being like that proper, or even a, a very good Star Trek captain that we've all come to know and love, uh, whether it's Kirk or Picard or uh, Cisco, even Janeway, they do have a particular level of quality that you expect from captains. And I believe Captain Hawk actually showed some of that with that scene. I just wish that when he said go to hell, it was a little bit more, more emphasized personally. I actually would agree with you on that, yeah. But going back to what Gunn was saying uh, with uh, magnitude, I remember, I don't know if you guys remember me saying that I wanted to make a mention on that. Uh, I completely want to amplify what he was saying uh, on that subject. When it, came to, when it came to the characters being in role, like for example, when they first showed the NX-4 uh, Discovery, uh, the ship was basically falling apart and it seemed like half of the crew was like not even concerned with it. And it's like the captain was really... You know, when he's sitting in his seat, he was actually jolting around and he seemed legitimately concerned of the situation that they were in. And there was just this split between some who knew that the ship was in danger and some who didn't. And, you know, it's one of those things where uh, a director needs to really see that as he's filming and sort of be like, okay, look, you're clearly not giving us enough. You, you need more. You need to show us that you're, you're pretty much on par with these other actors so that it feels like the scene is in the same dire situation well on on that kind of subject of the captain how do you feel he did obviously he's got the most important role the story is about him uh, it's his job to effectively lead the cast in in the story do you feel like he, he did a good job of being the centerpiece and carrying the story yeah i think i think the protagonist did very well i mean he uh from an acting standpoint, I, I think he, he did deliver, uh, especially for uh, this level of budget. Um, yeah, I think he did a pretty good job. There was a couple of technical errors, but, you know, again, uh, it's one of those things where I'll, you know, uh, give that up to just, uh, you know, the level of quality that this is. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think he definitely uh, needed some better supporting actors. I'd even go on a limb and say that. I think some of the some of the uh, some of the other actors that were in place, uh, you know, were not quite up to snuff when it came to their level of acting. So there was a pretty huge divide between characters. Uh, part of, like using that as part of a reason. I don't know how you guys felt about it. Well, like I just go back to my statement: the fact that they just the characters seem pretty generic, like they're interchangeable. Yeah, just monotone basically, through a lot of the scenes. 
I mean, I think actually one of the ones who also stood out for me as a highlight, for the most part, there was a couple of moments that didn't quite work, but I found that uh, Francis Brooks, the engineer, was quite natural in in his delivery of things for the most part. Some of the the more intimate scenes, he I think he struggled a little bit, which is not uncommon. You are doing harder scenes when you're trying to convey bigger emotions. But when he was in the captain's chair, I found that his role he filled that role of being the one in command quite well. I don't know if anybody disagrees with me on that. Well, but my 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 big disagreement on that is the fact that he still allowed his personal feelings um, about Tamara to influence his interaction with her. Um, it was almost like the the instruction that he gave her was an afterthought. Like, oh well, I guess I really should give you something to do. Well, guys, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to leave this uh, review in the middle of it. Uh, I do appreciate your time and your opinions, and I will uh, I will head off. But I wish you all a good time and enjoy the review. Thank you very much. Take care. So, moving on then from. Uh from the characters there was one thing that bothered me slightly just on that note talking about the captain is uh, he he reveals the fact that he loved Amelia which was kind of one of the, the bigger moments of the piece but his I found his reaction to her being injured whilst obviously the captain has to have a certain amount of composure his reaction wasn't quite enough for me he kind of just sat there and stared at her and then said somebody help her out and you'd think if he cared about her like that you'd at least see the moment of him na- acting kind of instinctively and then going wait a second I've got to remember where I am and what I'm doing yeah I, I, I would tend to agree with that um, he the, granted giving the, the backstory like they did where he walks out of their little get together while they're on shore leave uh, at, towards the beginning uh, yeah it, it gave a it showed his very human side and how he was trying to keep how he was dealing with that whole situation to himself and i mean i thought that that little scene was actually rather well done uh but when he basically rehashes it again when when talking to brooke it just no it that time it felt the second time felt forced well i mean it it as I said when we were watching it, it was one of those things of, of like, you you said to, to the guy when you first reveal that you had this history that you've never told anybody that before and then all of a sudden he reveals it again half, half an hour later, um, which kind of almost cheapened the moment a little bit. It was a thing of, oh, I've never revealed this information yet, here it is willy-nilly because it serves the moment that I'm in, um, which which detracted from, me, from it for me a little bit. I mean, I, I can understand trying to show the camaraderie. I, I really can. And in that, if, if that was the the plot device that was used, yeah, I, I can I can see that. But I, I think if it would, in this case, if it would have been a little more subtle, and, and not just this blaring throat punch of "here it is," then I think it would have worked considerably better overall. Just speaking of that of that scene when they are, they're all sitting around after the first uh, kind of opening action piece, um, my my only issue and this really stood out and unfortunately it is it is quite a big thing is that it was the the setting and the clothing really pulled me out of the scene, which I understand is a budget reason of obviously they need to show them in casual gear so why not just put them in normal clothing but as is established through first contact and through other things we've seen the clothing was a little bit too similar to how we dress nowadays and kind of really took me out of this moment of saying oh they're in the star trek universe in the future and now all of a sudden they're in the modern day well again this goes back to the budgetary concerns and the fact that he was trying to work within the limited budget that he was afforded through the i believe it was a kickstarter campaign um and, and yeah it's one of those of i overall the scene was great uh like i said it, it was just like you the i think they could have done a little bit more with the costuming um yeah the the costumes were um i, I guess you'd say a little too relaxed 
uh, it, it didn't have that feeling of yeah we're we're the senior staff of of a starship and we've become good friends through our trials our tribulations all that uh, it just it had it, it didn't have that sort of camaraderie feeling in general just because of how they were dressed and just how casual everything was in general yeah personally that if they had been on the, like in the captain's quarters or at the the galley and they had that conversation it would have been a little bit better i agree because they were it just didn't they it didn't seem to be the um Star Trek universe when they're all that casual. Yeah, that particular scene kind of echoed from uh, what is it? Uh, Star Trek 3 in the beginning when everyone's at Kirk's home or apartment in San Diego or San Francisco rather. Yeah, I mean it's kind of coming off what you said, Dragon the budgetary issues, which is why I looked at the scene and I went, yeah, this is a budget thing of it's going to be easier for them to do it in the clothing that they have. Um, so I kind of forgave it for that fact, but I actually agree uh, exactly so like what you said of let's put it on the ship and have it in one of the more relaxed locations similar to to when uh, Tasha Yar or any of the other characters who we lost throughout the series, the various series, you would have that moment where they're all still kind of on the ship and in uniform, but it's downtime. It's them reflecting on what had happened. Could have even been on the limp home for repairs. Very true. So talking of the ship, um, and moving on to, to kind of the next uh, big area, um, the set design and direction and all of the, the technical aspects of the uh, of the story, I found that although I understand why they did it to a degree, the the sets being completely CGI, I found to be quite distracting at times. Well, I didn't find the CGI distracting. What I found distracting was the the ship looked like it's a bunch. Of, it looked like it was a quilt put together. I mean, there's black, white, black, white. It just that I didn't that didn't sit too well with me. Like I said, it looked like a quilt somebody put together. I think some of the some of the sets, CG or otherwise, the the, the dressing was was okay. It actually harkened back to Enterprise, but I think because they got to that fidelity and the fact that they had to kind of fudge everything out of focus to kind of muddy up any imperfections that might be there, it, it made my eyes, it drew my eyes even that much more to the background because I wanted to see it because I've I've come accustomed to looking at the gizmos and gadgets in the background. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the the slightly out of focus was re- rather annoying. I mean, it. I'm used to seeing things sharp, and in fact, I don't like anything that's not sharp. I would, I don't like watching regular TV now that I have HD TV. That kind of thing. It to me, it's just out of focus is uh, puts me out of the reality of the situation. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that made Star Trek so successful was its sets. Um, the the way that things looked, the way that things were designed, uh, especially when once we got into TNG, when there was that much more kind of technology and, and the, the things that they could do, that bridge in TNG was one of the, the, the greatest things to, to look at. Um, it's why it was so nice when they spent so much time there. And I think that's true across the board for all of the shows, the show is almost defined by its bridge because that's where you spend a lot of the time. Um, I found, I think it is just a case of there is a lot of layers on top of what's going on to try and hide the imperfections, which I understand. But when I look at other things, say like Star Trek Continues, which has built a full set, um, and obviously they probably have more money, I don't know the figures, but I felt like you could substitute some of the money that was used to be able to create those effects to build a little bit more set, um, even just the bridge, uh, in in the parts that it needed of having all of the crew in the same place. Because the other thing that detracted from me was the fact that for most of it, as far as I could tell, I may be wrong on this, the crew weren't 
on the same set together. A lot of it was shot individually and then layered over the top. There was, I think, a, a single moment where the captain walks out of his room when they he first feels that weird glow in the room, and he's in there with Tamara, and he almost walks through her because they're not on the same set. And it, it there was just moments where it was like you could tell they weren't together, and it, it distracted from the what the story. You couldn't follow the story because I spent more time focusing on the fact that people were supposed to be looking at someone and they weren't. They were looking in a completely different direction. Yeah, now that I think about it, it was probably one of the main reasons why the acting was at so many different levels, even in the same scene. It was because they weren't all there to work off of each other. That That is a possibility. Um, but yeah, it, it's just one of those of where we, whether or not we are fully aware, but felt when it comes to filming, uh, sometimes, especially in fan films, getting able getting everybody together at the same time can be an issue. And sometimes you just have to do things as you're able to and then try to composite them together as best as possible. Granted. But then, of course, that job now falls on the director to kind of keep the tone level. Yeah. And, uh... and with this being his his freshman offering, um, yeah, I'm willing to overlook a lot of that. Um you you could, or at least I could tell, a a noticeable increase in the quality from the very beginning through to the end. Um, and he basically filmed the whole thing in chronological order, which I'm not sure in the long run was, was the best way to do it. Um, but you could definitely see his progression as a producer, director, uh Graphics, graphics designer, that sort of stuff through the through the course of the movie. Yeah. Well, go on, Sulek. Uh Basic. My 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 thing is is that I've listened to interviews of other actors, and they say that the most difficult thing to do is to react to somebody that's not there. The actors tend to play off the people, the actors that they're with. It helps them get into the character and and if it's overlay like that it's just like they don't know they can't see their face they can't see their intonation their voice things like that those are important those are things that you pick up on immediately when watching something well i mean if i'm allowed to go a bit kind of acting nerd on you here um one of the, the big things i always say is is acting is reacting uh, performances very much the best actors aren't people who can deliver lines it's people who can stand in the background not doing anything and are still kind of drawing the room which is one of those things of infamously Ian McKellen had a major issue when he was filming the Hobbit trilogy because instead of doing the, the smart camera work that they'd done in the Lord of the Rings trilogy they simply CGI'd him into shots with all of the dwarves. And he, he lost it at one point and basically said, look, I can't do this because I can't react to them. I can't react to the way that they move, the things that they do, the little ticks that people have. And that's the big aspect of, of being able to act. One of the first things I learned when I was in college was it's not being able to act when you're delivering lines. It's being able to be on stage when you're not doing anything and still convince the audience that you're there rather than just being a person standing on stage who's not doing anything at the time. And from my experience, the same applies to film. It's being able to not do anything and still feel like you're in the place which you say you are. Well, I understand. And I, I agree with that totally. Like I'm saying, you're, you guys say that they, he had overlays, like he had filmed one person and filled another. That particular that is particularly hard on the actors themselves because they can't, like I said, like you said, they can't react to what the other person is doing. So it makes it really difficult. That That's that's why I think it was a little bit uneven as far as the acting. And that very well may be the whole reason why we're, we, we noticed the, that a lot of the lines seemed rather deadpan. Um, that they're, they're, it just lacked that emotional feel to it. And that may be it in a nutshell. 
Um, I personally don't know. I kind of hope that is actually what was going on because, well, if not, well, that's a whole other show. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's a number of small things that tend to add up. So the slight dips in on every kind of level of, of being able to give the performance can then build up when it's on screen, which is a shame, but is almost a, a natural thing to happen. And as you say, this is his freshman effort. Um, and as he said on the... Uh, on Tribble, the Tribbles in Ecstasy podcast, the critique he's getting is not so that he can go back and do this again and change it, but for him to move forwards, what can he learn from this experience moving forwards? Which I thought was a, a very admirable thing to, to be able to say, because a lot of people don't like to admit that they can't get things right the first time. Um, and I think I think there is that element, and he, I think he can see it. The way that he was talking about it, he sees that there are limitations from that first effort and it's, it's something that is to be expected and it's not something that made me want to stop watching yeah me either and like everything else is uh if you don't fail you can't learn so the parts that he didn't get right he needs to he'll learn on the next one he'll make sure he does better on the next one and that's that's a sign of a good director who learns from his mistakes and says, okay. I can do better. No. Now, considering that this is his freshman effort, um, uh, let's let's just go ahead and, and, and get this out of the way. Um, on on a five star scale, with zero being uh, why did you even attempt this, to five being for a freshman offering, this is absolutely amazing. I'd like to hear everybody's impression as to where this would fall on that scale. Oh, probably three and a half. I uh, yeah, I don't you know, tend to do things in the five star. I tend to do in the ten, so I'd say three and a half as well. It's a seven, which uh, for me is because I see five as being the absolute average. Um, if your film is average, you're not trying hard enough. This film is is a seven. It, it's it's got its imperfections, it's got its pitfalls, but unlike other fan films that I've seen, which will go unmentioned. I didn't hit a point with this where I'm sitting there going, God, can this hurry up and please finish? Because I was enjoying it. I was genuinely enjoying it, and I was interested, one, at where it was going, and two, to see the way that it was done. Okay, Gunberg, what what do you think? Well, I'm a bit of a fan of the, the 10 scale as well, but ditto on Dragon, or uh, ditto on Max uh, evaluation. Uh, it was definitely, for... Very, uh, first pass, and for a decent story, I I, I would definitely give him a 7. Now, I, the only reason why I chose the, the five-star scale is because it's one that most people can can relate to. Uh, Ten-star definitely gives a lot more room for, for interpretation. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say oh, probably three and three-quarter to four-star. Uh, again, it, it's a, a number of the, the little things that that we've, we've noticed that, uh, well, because of the fact that, yes, we are Star Trek fans, and because of that, we are a little more technically minded, and we pick up on some of the yeah, smaller things a lot faster than others. That, that was the biggest attraction for me. Um, but because of the fact it's a freshman offering, I, I'm not going to detract too much from the overall score. Um, the, the actors for me was the other part that, that kept it from getting rated higher. It, not the actors themselves, but their delivery. And again, if this is one where they, they could not be together to film at the same time for whatever reason, then it's considerably more understandable. Uh, but yeah, I'd give it a, a three and three quarter, if not four star, just because I mean, for a freshman, for a freshman offering, and the fact that he did this all on his own, every last bit of it, the music, the the filming, the CGI, the the uh, the all, all the video work, um, yeah, I, I have to, I'm, I'm damned impressed. Well, I'm impressed for a freshman off, off offering, yes. Um... But as you said, he wanted critique on it, so and that's what I gave him, and that's what we all give him. And he should take away that while it was enjoyable, there are some aspects that he needs to work on. 
I'll, I'll say this because I feel like I, uh, this is one of the big things for me and this is something that always comes across in Star Trek. The new Star Trek films have this issue and it's something that I think a lot of people miss out on because things are obviously always evolving in the way that things are shot. But there is a there is a standard with Star Trek, not a standard in terms of quality, but a standard in terms of the way that things are usually done that give it a certain feel, which is the biggest thing that's a drawback for me was um, the camera work. Because Star Trek, for the most part, was always shot with static cameras. It was... Uh, the, the cameras were still, they shot things... Even the action was still. Um, the space battles, instead of us moving with the ships, the, the ships moved within the, the canvas that was presented to us. And it's the biggest thing that, that really threw me off towards the beginning was there was a lot of shaky camera work. And obviously it's done with a handheld camera or a shoulder cam. Um, and it's designed to effectively make things feel more tense. But I actually found that it was more distracting and I do generally with filmmaking. No matter what the film, whether it's a top quality blockbuster or whether it's a small indie film like this one, if you're, especially within Star Trek, the the, the action for me should be static, especially with the ships. Because it gives you that feel of the size and the way that they move. Star Trek ships are are naval vessels. They're not fighter planes. Star Wars had fighter planes in the way that they moved. The way that the ships flew around, the way that the X-Wings moved were very fighter plane-like. Whereas Star Trek was always more naval. It was slow turning and, and slow moving. And the only exceptions to that were things like the Defiant. Small, fast speedy little darting in and out ships and i th for me the biggest thing was was the camera work in space and the camera work on on ground needed to be more static because i felt at times that it was almost a little bit too kind of i feel like i'm getting thrown about a little bit trying to follow everything well see with me that's actually one of the things that i enjoyed because yeah granted they're they're based upon naval vessels however uh, our naval vessels are only allowed to move basically within a 3D plane based upon the level of the water around them. Where when it comes to travel in space, you literally have an infinite combination of directions that you can go at any given point. And that, that freedom of movement, it, it, I actually enjoyed and could appreciate uh, uh, considerably better with the way that he presented it. Well, I think shaky cam is becoming the norm. I think people are trying to get used to this whole documentary style filmmaking where we really want you to get, get the, the audience in with the characters as if we're sitting right there. We're, we have someone actually being able to record this for us to be able to see what happened during these events. But it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? It's like if you really want to get the audience that invested into these characters, you really have to work on the characters. Otherwise, if you get too close, it seems a little fake. Yeah, the whole fight scene going through that Iconian Tower, just yeah, the camera work in there was, was a little sketchy, personally. I mean, okay, I A lot sketchy. I mean, I think for me it was a case of saying it was it was less action packed in its entirety than most modern efforts on Star Trek because action has become very much the norm for keeping people interested. Action and comedy is the way that people we keep people interested nowadays, which is a shame because actually when you get really high quality films, those aren't the two things that stick out. And for the most part, this film didn't stick to those two aspects. There's virtually no comedy in it, which I'm going to put my hand up and say I love the fact that there's virtually no comedy in it because it's very easy to do wrong. Um, and the action, I felt like that's seen through the Iconian Tower as you described it, Dragon, during when we were watching it. I believe it was you. It might not have been. Um, it was a little bit too much like a video game. There was times where it was like, it felt like that. I, I looked at it and went, this isn't needed in here. You could do without that aspect and make it a little bit more subdued because your story and the story that you're telling is enough to propel your to, to keep your audience invested. I, I wish I could take credit for saying that, but no, that was not me that made that comment. It's okay, I remembered halfway through that it was gun. 
<laughs> Apology accepted. But yeah, I mean that that series through there with the way that the camera was was bouncing up and down. I, I understand it, it may have been trying to be used to try to give us that sense of urgency, how time was slipping away, and this was basically a visual representation of the hand of the clock on that countdown. But in this case, I feel that it was an unnecessary addition, and if anything, it was a major distraction from the story. Okay, so maybe I gave it too much thought. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, um, I'm, I've am i covered all of the questions which I've written down, so it's kind of a bit freeform now. Yeah, well, I think we've beat it to death as much as possible. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I will agree. We have beat this, beat this show pretty hard. But I will have to say, Tommy, it was an honor to have had you on Tribbles and Ecstasy. It's an honor to be able to do this review for you. Um, I, I thank you for, for requesting us to, to, to do this. Um, this, we, yes, as you've probably noticed, we have some real serious fan movie fans in here, and, and we pick up on a lot of things. But that being said, one hell of an effort for, especially for it being a freshman outing, and I, I wish you the best in your future endeavors, and may they be as widely accepted as this one has already started being, and may they be even better. Well, I'll, I'll put, say this to Tommy. I mean, for a freshman, it's a really good. You do need to learn from the, the critiques that we have given, but I would imagine you are because you seem to be a smart individual. So... Uh, best of luck to you, and I really hope you keep keep going and make keep getting things better and better. Because that's the only thing you can do is get better and better. The only way you can fail is never try. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I mirror that sentiment as well. Um, the the avid movie fans that that uh, Dragon's referring to, I am one of those, um, and I am very uh, very harsh on my films these days. Very brutally honest with them. Um, and I, as I said on the podcast itself, I apologised if if I didn't enjoy it because I would genuinely uh, tear it apart. Um, but I have to admit, I went in with with lower expectations than I came out with. Um, you provided a story which was an interesting concept. You kept my interest throughout, um, and it's only the things that really stood out were the little things, and that's kind of what what I wanted to to get out of this is to to look at it and say, look, overall, you're doing a good job with this. It's the little things, but those are things that can be fixed going forwards, which I know is what you wanted uh, to do with with kind of people giving you critiques of it. So, um, thank you for making it. Thanks for uh, for putting another Star Trek thing out there, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing what you do next. <laughs> Ditto, basically. You kind of run out of things to say at that point, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in all honesty, I actually haven't really ventured into the whole fan film industry, as it were, and uh, I've always been kind of leery of uh, properties that I've invested myself in, especially things like Star Trek, so it's like I always want to try to keep Star Trek in my mind as pristine as I possibly can. You know, take with it as you will. Oh, I share that sentiment completely. I trust no one with the things that I care about. I don't even trust CBS with Star Trek. Um, but maybe we'll save that discussion for another another uh, podcast, which hopefully there will be more of if you guys are interested in uh, continuing this uh, new outing. Sure. You know what? Oh, I've had a blast. It. I think we ought to make this a regular thing. I can hear the internet shuttering now. <laughs> Was okay. that the internet or just the directors? <laughs> yeah, well, if they can't take the heat, stay out of the fire. Couldn't have said it better myself. So, if uh, nobody has anything else... I'm done. Other than, uh, yeah, if you ask us to, to critique your stuff... Well, you've been warned. Master Gumberg? No, I think I'm done. Well done, Tommy. Can't wait to see what you got up your sleeves next. 
Fantastic. Well, that's the uh, first Omega United Roundtable review. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'm going to say it, critique us. Uh, tell us what we could do better. This is going to be an ever-evolving thing. So, And we will see you next time, hopefully.